and today we're going to be talking about cell transport. What cells are moving back and forth. So what do cells have to transport? Well, cells have to transport several different things. First of all, food it has to go into the cells. Waste products that go out of the cells and chemical messengers that go both ways. Cells transport materials in three different ways, and those ways are diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. Uh, in live class, we'll have a, uh, a couple of uh, lab experiments to show osmosis and diffusion, and we'll also have, if we're in remote learning, some activities to, to highlight both of those. Let's first dive into diffusion. Diffusion is particles that are moving from high concentration to low concentration. You don't need any energy whatsoever. So in this case, I have these pink particles down here in the left corner, and I have this space for which they can fill. You can kind of think of this like a perfume bottle. When I take a perfume bottle and I put it in the middle of a room, and I open up the perfume, the people closest to the perfume are going to smell it first, the people furthest away are going to smell it last. So we say that the, the perfume is diffusing throughout the room. High concentration here, if I set this in motion, those particles are going to spread themselves out. And now it's in lower concentration because those particles are spread out further. This is something that happens naturally. Osmosis is the same basic idea, except water moves from a high water concentration to a low water concentration. All it is is the diffusion of water across a membrane. And then we have to have a specific type of membrane. We have to have what's called a semi-permeable membrane. Semi-permeable is just a word that means that the membrane allows some things through but keeps other things out. And that's almost always based on cell size, or it's not cell size, but particle size. Bigger particles can't get through, smaller particles can. So let's take a look at a short video here on osmosis. Although water molecules are polar, they are small enough to pass through the membrane freely. This special case of diffusion that involves the movement of water molecules across a membrane is called osmosis. If a molecule such as urea is added to one side of a membrane, it will not be able to diffuse across the membrane because it is both large and polar. Because of its polar nature, it will interact with other polar molecules such as the water. This interaction reduces the number of free water molecules on the right-hand side. With fewer free water molecules on the right-hand side, there is now a net movement of water molecules down their concentration gradient to the side with the urea molecules. Now, if you watch this, you will notice that the right side is getting more water, the left side is losing water. That's because the urea, the big green molecules, can't move through the membrane, but the water molecules can. Because more water molecules are moving into this area than are leaving, the water level on the right side will rise. If the osmotic concentrations of two solutions are equal, the solutions are isotonic. However, when the solutions have unequal osmotic concentrations, the solution with the higher concentration of solutes is hypertonic, and the solution with the lower concentration of solutes is hypotonic. Hypertonic is just a word that means it has more water molecules, and so if you visually look, there was more water molecules let me get it summed up here. I didn't know it was going to stop like that. There's more water molecules on the right than there are on the left. There are fewer water molecules down here. So hypo means under, hyper means over. So we have over amount of water, under amount of water. So our next thing here is active transport. Active transport, a cell uses energy to bring things into or out of the cell. So on this thing, these things don't naturally happen. What we need to do is we need to supply energy to the cell. There's three types, or three basic types at least, of active transport. There's an active transport called endocytosis, meaning bringing things into the cell. There's two types of those. One is called phagocytosis, which is the cell bringing in food molecules. And there's pinocytosis, where the cell is bringing in liquids. So phago is food, pino is liquid. There's also moving things out of the cell, which would be exocytosis. Endo means inside, and exo means outside. And then finally, there's receptor-mediated active transport, and these are special receptors on the cell that are allowing things to pass through. We're going to take a look at a couple of short videos on this. We have active transport here, and so we have this amoeba. This is probably in the neighborhood of 500 times magnification, and this is the amoeba in the center here, and we have a paramecium over here on the left, and we're going to watch what happens with the paramecium.
My guess is that there's some kind of lure, some kind of chemical that's being sent out to lure the paramecium in. Because you might ask, why is the paramecium going to end up getting trapped? I'm not exactly sure. There has to be something there to attract that paramecium. So you now see that the amoeba is extending its what are called pseudo feet here, pseudopods, and it's enveloping that paramecium to the point where it gets stuck. And then eventually what will happen is that it will completely seal off. The cell wall here on the amoeba will break down and start releasing digestive enzymes and will start breaking down that paramecium. So at this point, this paramecium is kind of stuck and will eventually be digested. This would be endocytosis, and since this is food particles, this would be phagocytosis. All right, I think we got the gist here. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. There it is completely sealed off, and now eventually it will start being digested. Um, here's a short video on active transport. Recall that there are two types of cellular transport, passive and active. Passive requires no added energy, but active does require added energy. Active transport also moves from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration or up the concentration gradient. This is the opposite of passive transport, and because it's more difficult, it needs the energy molecule called ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate because there's an adenosine molecule and three phosphate molecules. There are three types of active transport, membrane pumps, endocytosis, and exocytosis. Let's look at membrane pumps first. So the membrane pumps are what I call the receptor mediated ones in our notes. Same thing. Membrane pumps are just carrier proteins that move substances from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. Let's look at the sodium-potassium pump to see how it works. Outside the cell, there's a high concentration of sodium ion, or Na+. The brackets represent the word concentration. Inside the cell, there's a high concentration of potassium ion, or K+. The cell has ion channels that will allow these ions to diffuse and reach equilibrium, but the cell doesn't actually want that. It wants to keep a difference in concentration. So the sodium-potassium pump will force more sodium out and more potassium in all the time. Let's see how this works. First, three sodium ions from the cytosol bind to the protein, and a phosphate group from ATP breaks off in the carrier protein. This provides energy for the shape of the protein to change, and the sodium ions can be released into the outside of the cell. Now two potassium ions will enter the pump, which causes the phosphate to break off and return the pump to its original shape and release the potassium into the cytosol. Again, sodium will diffuse into the cell on its own and potassium will diffuse out. The pump forces the sodium to be outside the cell and the potassium to be inside the cell. Another way that cells do active transport is through vesicle movement, either endocytosis or exocytosis. Endocytosis brings items into the cell, and exocytosis pushes them out of the cell. Endocytosis is the process by which cells ingest external fluid, macromolecules, or other large particles, even other cells. We can be more specific about what materials undergo endocytosis. Phagocytosis is where large particles or whole cells are ingested, and pinocytosis is when solutes or fluids are ingested. You can think of phagocytosis as cell eating and pinocytosis as cell drinking. Here you can see the way it works. First, the cell membrane begins to pinch around the substances, and eventually it forms a vesicle which can carry the substance to any part of the cell. Exocytosis is basically the opposite of endocytosis. It's a process by which a substance is released from a cell through a vesicle that transports it to the cell surface and fuses with the cell membrane. A vesicle can merge with the cell membrane because they're both made of phospholipids. So what you're seeing here is 
the, the vesicle formation, the vesicle is just basically a lipid bilayer where it surrounds certain things. And so the little blue dots here are the liquids or whatever you have, uh, maybe food particles, and the membrane forms, breaks itself off, and the, the little vesicle is just like a little carrier. Ladies and gentlemen, that is cell transport. Uh, thank you for your time.